In this cladogram from the textbook, five kinds of bacteria are named, and they happen to be the exact same five kinds of bacteria that I typically like to highlight in my survey of the bacterial domain. Realize that this tree is heavily pruned. It doesn't show the smaller twigs and branches of bacteria that don't fit into any of the five named clades. It also doesn't attempt to depict the vast diversity that exists within these clades. All five of them were already in existence during the Archean Eon, and they've been evolving along their independent trajectories for a much longer time than any of the eukaryotes that we don't see until the Proterozoic. Each of these bacterial clades was established from a common ancestor deep within the Archean. This is a scale of billions of years ago. In comparison, the diversification of animals and plants has unfolded over a scale of hundreds of millions of years, so the phylogenetic distance between these clades of bacteria is far greater than any that you'll see between any two eukaryotes. When you look at two different kinds of bacteria, say E. coli and Pseudomonas, both of these names you should recognize from a microbes laboratory, it might seem like they're closely related. These two in particular even come from the same group within the proteobacteria, the gamma proteobacteria. But the fundamental lineages of E. coli and the pseudomonads have been distinct from deeply within the Archean Eon, and thus these two are way more distantly related from each other than you are from a fungus. Remember that evolutionary relationships depend on how long ago the most recent common ancestor existed, and for you and a fungus, that common ancestor would be Proterozoic after 2.5 billion years ago, whereas the most recent common ancestor shared by E. coli and Pseudomonas would be something embedded in the Archean Eon, earlier than 2.5 billion years ago. We're going to survey five bacterial clades, identify some specific members within each clade, and talk about where they exist in nature, and then try to describe some aspect of the biology that makes them different from other bacteria. We're going to start with spirochetes. Spirochetes are corkscrew-shaped bacteria that have a unique mode of motility that's derived from the standard kind of bacterial flagellum seen in other bacteria. We have to start by describing the normal flagellum, which you've already seen to some degree in that video on the Dover Intelligent Design Trial. The creationists, you remember, they tried to argue that the bacterial flagellum is an example of something that could not result from gradual evolution. And then along comes Ken Miller to demonstrate that the flagellar components could have important functionalities without being part of the flagellum. To me, maybe the neatest thing about the bacterial flagellum is that it's a true wheel, or actually a rotor with a spindle-like structure that rotates freely. If you think about it, the wheel slash rotor is a pretty useful device for humans. And unlike a lot of other useful things that we have, there's no parallel for this in nature. We don't find animals with wheels that allow them to roller skate in pursuit of their prey. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. First, it would be pretty hard to come up with a way for the body to provide a blood supply and a nervous connection with a wheel organ that rotates freely around a central axis. And even if it were possible for animals to do this, it's also probably true that there would be little advantage to having roller skates unless there were smooth roads or tracks to skate upon. Imagine some kind of horse on roller skates, having to move across uneven and sometimes soft terrain, and you could see how four legs without the skates is actually a better option. In the bacterial flagellum, not to be confused with the flagellum of eukaryotic cells that we'll see later, it really does have a true rotor, which looks like a spool, whose axis of rotation is perpendicular with the plane of the bacterial membrane and the cell wall. Inside, there's a molecular motor that rotates the spool, while outside, there's a hook that causes the filament not to point straight out of the center of the spindle. The flagellum is actually a lot like a propeller on a motorboat. By rotating the spindle in one direction, the flagellum pushes water away from the membrane, creating thrust for cellular movement. If the motor reverses, the flagellum whips wildly, moving water across the cell surface, and the cell starts to rotate randomly. The result is a sort of motility known as run and twiddle, in which a bacterial cell using this normal flagellum type has two moves. A run, which causes the cell to move more or less in a straight line, and a twiddle, in which the cell spins around randomly. Using a light microscope, the flagella themselves are too small to see, but the cells are visible under high power, and by looking at their movement you can tell how their flagella are being used. 
The advantage that a motile cell has over one that lacks flagella is that it can disperse more rapidly, potentially finding new food resources more quickly than non-motile cells. You might see that a downside to this is that for cells that are located in an area of food abundance surrounded by a food desert, being motile might actually be a disadvantage because it would make you more likely to move away from the best habitat. Bacterial cells are actually able to use their two moves, run and twiddle, together with an ability to sense food richness in the extracellular world to achieve an adaptive behavior called chemotaxis, the ability to move systematically in one direction determined by a chemical gradient. By following the simple rule, if food richness is increasing, run for longer and twiddle less frequently. Whereas if the food richness is decreasing, then you twiddle more frequently. If you do this, the cells end up moving toward and sticking around an area of high food availability. So that's your typical standard issue flagellum as used by the majority of motile bacteria. Spirochetes, however, use a variation on this theme in which the flagellum rotates using the same basic mechanism, but it remains inside the periplasmic space, that is, between the inner and outer membranes. Bacterial cells typically have this double membrane structure, and the peptidoglycan cell wall is within the periplasm. In the case of spirochetes, not only is the cell wall in the periplasm, but also the flagellum, which runs the length of an elongate cell with a cell body wrapping around the flagellum, or sometimes multiple flagella in a sort of cable, making the cell shape a spiral or corkscrew. When the flagellum rotates, it causes the whole corkscrew cell body to rotate, and the cell moves up or down depending on the rotation of the flagella. This form of motility works well enough in water. Many spirochetes live as free-living aquatic organisms. But this style of cellular motility is especially adaptive for cells that need to move through viscous matter, like slime or mucus. This thicker material would be a trap for cells that use the normal kind of flagella, but a spirochete could penetrate through this goo much the same way that a corkscrew penetrates a cork in a wine bottle. It's not an exaggeration to say that with a spirochete, natural selection has produced two of the six basic machines that we learn about in a physics class, the wheel axle and also the screw. Now, spirochetes that are parasitic are usually associated with diseases in which the parasite accesses the host's body through mucous membranes. Uh, mucous membranes are covered with a mucus slime uh, that's normally a protection against other kinds of bacteria. However, spirochete parasites would be able to penetrate them more or less freely. One example of a spirochete parasite is Treponema pallidum, which is the pathogenic agent causing syphilis, a uh, very well-known sexually transmitted disease. Another example of a spirochete parasite would be Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the agent that causes Lyme disease. Lyme disease is transmitted by the bites of ticks, deer ticks, and it gets its name from the town of Lyme in Connecticut. Okay, that's pretty much it, but I want you to note that in covering spirochetes as a topic, we've actually done a lot more than just spirochetes. We've actually talked about the normal bacterial flagellar mechanism, chemotaxis, mucus defenses against pathogens, as well as a couple specific examples of spirochete parasites. Now the chlamydiae is the sister clay to the spirochetes, according to the cladogram in the textbook. But these two bacteria really couldn't be more different. The chlamydiae are highly specialized to live as intracellular parasites. And in fact, you really wouldn't qualify them as alive in the normal sense, unless they're in a host cell. The infectious phase of chlamydia is the elementary body, completely shut down metabolically, and it's not until the elementary body gets taken in by a host cell that it starts to grow and undergo cell divisions. After a few cycles of cell divisions, all of the chlamydia inside of the host become elementary bodies, and that causes the host cell to lyse, releasing the elementary bodies to go out and infect other host cells, maybe within the same host individual, or maybe in other hosts. Now, if you know something about viruses, what I've just described should strike you as being very similar to the viral infectious cycle. And so is a chlamydial cell some sort of a transitional evolutionary phase between cellular life and viruses? Well, no. Chlamydiae are bacteria and cellular, and therefore alive. Whereas a virus, being non-cellular, 
does not qualify as being a living organism. Now, one of the easy ways in which we can tell the difference between a chlamydia as an intracellular parasite versus a virus is that when a virus undergoes replication inside of a host cell, it does this thing where it uh, releases the viral genome, and the genome then gets transcribed and translated, and you end up with the host cell being commandeered to produce huge amounts of viral proteins as well as viral DNA or RNA. And then after all that material is produced, then you undergo a period of viral assembly. It's like you're causing the host cell to create all the parts of the virus, and then you assemble the viral particles from those parts. In contrast, the chlamydia inside of a host cell can be seen to undergo binary fission. They're basically undergoing cell division inside of the host. In other words, they've got that cellular behavior that really distinguishes them from a virus. Besides this, the chlamydial genome can be sequenced, and it shows that it's been descended from the original cell that ancestored all of life, whereas viruses don't have that characteristic. Viruses, instead, seem to derive from molecular parasites that take advantage of a living cell's molecular machinery to replicate. We have other non-viral examples of molecular parasites. There are RNA viroids, or transposable elements. You'll probably learn about these in Bio 204. And it's actually easy enough to visualize natural selection driving the evolution of some type of molecular parasite into a more sophisticated version of that parasite that eventually becomes an effective pathogenic agent against those cells, and the viruses are probably one of those things. Back to chlamydia. Now, the chlamydiae have also become highly adapted as intracellular parasites, and as an outcome, it has evolved some unique traits that make perfect sense given this long history of natural selection. In a lot of ways, they have become more virus-like in terms of size. And in fact, the chlamydial elementary body is smaller than some of the larger viral particles. Smaller size makes them better for transmission. Okay. Um, chlamydial cells are also very simple. They've lost a lot of the unnecessary parts, making replication simpler and faster. The chlamydiae are also unique among cellular life in not having any means of generating ATP through metabolism. The cells still need ATP for energy, just like all other cells, but instead of making their own ATP, they absorb it from the host, and consequently they need no glycolysis or Krebs cycle or any of the other mechanisms. They also don't need a peptidoglycan cell wall, which usually serves as protection for a living cell. Chlamydiae live inside of their host cells and are not exposed to the same challenges as other bacteria. Being dependent on their host cells and ultimately destroying them in their infectious cycle, it's not surprising that chlamydiae are associated with diseases as pathogenic agents. One specific example of a sexually transmitted disease caused by chlamydia is trachoma, which is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. While this is a disease that affects humans, other species are affected as well, most notably koala bears. Uh, right now, there's an epidemic of trachoma that's spreading like wildfire through the wild koala populations in Australia. Apparently, they're rather promiscuous. Another example of a chlamydial parasite is chlamydia cetacei, which is not a sexually transmitted disease. It's actually transmitted to humans from birds. In birds, it's kind of like an intestinal parasite. It causes birds to get the runs. Bird handlers, you know, people that trade in exotic birds, are actually the ones that are most likely to contract this thing called parrot fever, uh, which is a pneumonia. Basically, it gets uh, transmitted from bird poop, which then uh, becomes dust in the bottom of bird cages. Uh, that dust gets inhaled by the bird handlers, and it develops in the bird handlers as a form of pneumonia. Yeah, it's kind of gross. But that would be another example of a chlamydial disease. Chlamydial diseases are notoriously hard to diagnose because you really can't culture the chlamydial parasite easily. You pretty much have to detect them through some other non-traditional modern means. And so uh, the treatment of chlamydia is definitely possible. They can be treated with some normal antibiotics. Detecting them and distinguishing them from a vile parasite is something that requires a little bit more sophisticated diagnostic techniques. Okay, the next two groups of bacteria are the firmicutes or firmicutes and the cyanobacteria, which according to your textbook phylogeny are sister clades separate from the chlamydia spirochete group. But again, these two groups are not thematically similar in any significant way. 
The Firmicutes are what many people in the biomedical realm identify as gram-positive bacteria. The short history here is that at one time we had no idea that bacteria were even there. Once we realized that bacteria were the cause of some diseases and that we could culture the disease-causing agents either in broth culture or in petri dishes, it became important for us to distinguish between different kinds of bacteria. Okay, so Hans Christian Gramm came up with a staining procedure in which we colored the cells first with a purple dye. And after the cells were stained purple, we tried to wash away the purple color using a mixture of acetone and alcohol. Gramm found that the cells either decolorize very easily or they hold on to the purple stain even through the alcohol acetone wash. The cells that keep the stain remaining purple when observed microscopically are the ones that are called gram-positive, while the decolorized cells are called gram-negative. The main difference between gram-positive and gram-negative is the thickness of peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Most bacteria have two membranes. Remember the spirochetes? There's a narrow periplasmic space in which the peptidoglycan layer lies. Firmicutes basically have done away with the outer membrane altogether, and they lay down a very thick, multi-layered wall of peptidoglycan, which creates a physically sturdier wall that holds onto the purple stain very tightly in the gram stain procedure. In this way, that is, not having an outer membrane, but having a thick peptidoglycan cell wall, the firmicutes are unique among the bacteria. Now these firmicutes, or gram-positive bacteria, include a lot of free-living forms, decomposers mostly, because that's what bacteria mostly do, as well as a few pathogenic or commensal types. By commensal, I'm referring to cells that live in association with a host, but not causing the host any physical harm. The microbiota on your skin contains a vast majority of gram-positive sphere-shaped bacteria, including Staphylococcus epidermidis and Micrococcus luteus. Having a robust and diverse microbiome of commensal species is actually pretty important as a barrier against pathogenic bacteria. By shedding skin cells continually, you continually feed the cells like Staph epidermidis, and in so doing you're maintaining a huge horde of harmless cells that make it much more difficult for bad bacteria to establish and cause disease. Some firmicutes are pathogenic, like Staphylococcus aureus an agent that causes a variety of diseases on the skin as well as elsewhere. The difference between a pathogen like Staph aureus and a harmless commensal like Staph epidermidis is in the cell's production of virulence factors, toxins, and enzymes that allow the cells to penetrate the barriers that normally keep microbes from invading. A somewhat separate issue from the distinction between commensals and pathogenic types of bacteria is the way that bacteria are sometimes used by humans to cause chemical changes to food. Sometimes this causes the food to become less vulnerable to spoilage by microbes. For example, cheese and cured sausages make use of lactic acid bacteria whose fermentation products change the pH and add desirable flavors to the foods that they're introduced to. Lactic acid bacteria, including some species of Streptococcus, Lactobacillus, and Leuconostoc, are part of the Firmicutes. Now, you probably associate the term strep with things like strep throat and scarlet fever. And again, the difference between the bacterium that causes scarlet fever and the one that's used to make mozzarella is in the chemicals that they produce. This underscores another theme that of metabolic diversity in the bacteria especially. Now remember that they started evolving and adapting to new environmental challenges 3.5 billion years ago. They have been under strong selection to make use of whatever resources have been available, and consequently they have evolved the ability to metabolize just about any kind of energy-containing compound that's produced by nature, as well as a lot of compounds that are only present because human chemists have synthesized them. Now onwards to the cyanobacteria. This is the bacterial clade responsible for the great oxygenation. They're the ones that first use oxygenic photosynthesis in a huge way, and as a result they changed the atmosphere from one in which O2 was largely absent to one in which O2 was permanently there, eventually becoming abundant. The chloroplasts we find in eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms like plants derive 
from cyanobacteria. And so you can say that in one form or another, either as free bacteria or as organelles within other cells, cyanobacteria are responsible for nearly all of the O2 the Earth has ever had. In case you need it one more time, here is the summary reaction for oxygenic photosynthesis. And now I'll give you a couple of examples of specific organisms in this group that you might at some point in your life have had experience firsthand. So anyone who's been to a smoothie shop has at least had the chance to ingest spirulina, which may be the most sustainable food that anyone could ever eat. What I'm showing you here are real spirulina. The dietary supplement is usually, maybe even always, a closely related genus of cyanobacterium, Arthrospira, which is grown in massive cultures. Spirulina is highly nutritious, if not terribly exciting to eat, and it's one piece in the array of potential solutions to the vexing question of how we can address the issue of food security as a population of humans on our planet grows to 10 billion by the year 2050, and even greater beyond that time. My other example of a cyanobacterium is Rivularia, a filamentous multicellular cyanobacterium. Yes, I did say multicellular to describe an organism from the domain bacteria. I may have mentioned this before, that in order to qualify as multicellular, an organism must do more than just have many cells. For example, a cluster or string of identical cells would not be multicellular. There's another requirement, and that's that the cells must be differentiated in morphology and specialized in function, contributing to an integrated multicellular unit. Now, Rivularia qualifies as multicellular based on these two criteria. It's filamentous, and at the base of the filament, where the organism attaches to a substrate, there's a heterocyst that is specialized as either a storage cell or a rapid regeneration cell. What it does is it stores carbohydrate produced by the photosynthetic cells of the filament, and then in the event of herbivory or the scouring off the filament, it can rapidly grow a new photosynthetic filament by using the energy and raw materials that are stored in the heterocyst. Now, when I was a college student, I rented an apartment with four other guys. Our landlord was a retired army colonel who sometimes made impromptu visits to see how well we were keeping up his property. He would give us a warning call before coming, and that gave us a chance to quickly scrub the algae that were growing in the toilet bowls. Now, the amazing part of this whole ordeal was that about an hour after the inspection, a green fuzz in the bowl was starting to be visible again. This was my first experience with Revularia, and I want you to note that this is more than just a cute story from my past. The issues of multicellularity and how it has adaptive value for an organism like Revularia are being addressed here as well. Now we'll pick up the cyanobacterial narrative again when we talk about endosymbiosis in the next lecture, and then again with the evolution of plants. So finally, there's the proteobacteria. Proteo comes from the Greek sea god who could change shape. Basically, this is a concept of a shapeshifter. Sasha Baron Cohen would be appropriately described as a protean actor. Proteobacteria fit this prefix by being so diverse in shape, physiology, and ecology that they're impossible to characterize. It's like somebody just gave up and called them the shape-shifting bacteria. And this is actually incorrect. Any one kind of proteobacteria is what it is. It doesn't change except over the evolutionary time scale. Now, all the proteobacteria have the gram-negative cell wall structure with two membranes and a peptidic glycan cell wall layer within the periplasm. But this is the ancestral characteristic for the whole domain bacteria. Cyanobacteria and spirochetes both have this gram-negative cell wall, and they're not in the proteobacteria. We use the term symplesiomorphy rather than synapomorphy to describe a trait like this, where it's shared by all the members, but it's also shared with other members of the lineage stretching back to before the most recent common ancestor. Here, the gram-negative cell wall is the ancestral state for all cells in the domain bacteria. While all proteobacteria are gram-negative, it's not at all appropriate to say that they are the gram-negative bacteria. That said, it's also true that, with few exceptions, 
the medically important gram-negative bacteria are in the proteobacteria. I'll add here that among the exceptions are the spirochetes and the chlamydia, both medically important and gram-negative, but not proteobacterial. Within the proteobacteria, there are five recognized clades, identified by the Greek letters alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. The alpha proteobacteria include the rhizobia, the nitrogen-fixing symbionts within some plants, as well as some intracellular parasites like rickettsia, which is the agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But our main interest in the alpha proteobacteria is that this is the source of the bacterial cell that became the eukaryotic mitochondrion through the process of endosymbiosis. We'll talk about this in the next lecture. The gamma proteobacteria is the only other group that I'll give examples from, because here is where the enterobacteriales, the group including E. coli and salmonella, as well as the pseudomonadales, which we should have seen represented by pseudomonas, which was the clearly motile bacteria in our lab exercise. Now my final note here is that this survey isn't at all complete. The bacteria are, by many measures, the dominant form of life on Earth, far more numerous and diverse compared with the eukaryotic forms of life that are more familiar to us, mostly because they're big enough for us to see. This survey just barely scratches the surface, but it does attempt to give you a picture of the range of prokaryotic life that's out there. Now, as far as the exam is concerned, be prepared to recognize the main clades that I've highlighted in this video identifying their important characteristics. Also, be able to name a couple of representative species and say where you'd be able to find them in nature.